morning we continue our journey through Luke chapter 15. I invite you to turn with me there. You'll recall that last week we read the first two parables of three that Jesus shares in Luke chapter 15. So I want to go back to the very beginning of the chapter just to be reminded of the context for this story. And then we'll continue reading uh, a bit later in the chapter. So Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, and then picking up again at verse 11. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. You'll recall last week we studied together the first parable that Jesus shared next, the parable of the lost sheep, and the second parable that Jesus told, the parable of the lost coin. Today we'll study the third, which begins in verse 11. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property amongst them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with With compassion, he ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he's got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your commands. Yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice Because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. 
back before any of us would have known of this as one of the most popular stories in the history of Western civilization. Back before any of us was familiar with the phrase prodigal son or saw it used in secular usage again and again and again, taking on a life of its own. Back before there was a New Testament. Back even before the event that brought all these listeners together. This was just a story. It was a story in the mind of Christ. And just as an aside, as we begin this morning, I would just point out that if we read it as a story and just appreciate it for the simple, straightforward characters presented and developed therein, there's a profound lesson for family life even in the 21st century. A couple of them, actually. For those of us among us today who are parents, who among us hasn't at times taken a one-size-fits-all approach to parenting? And I won't ask for testimony, but how'd that work out? We'll look this morning at a few Old Testament parallels between this passage and those Hebrew scriptures, but if we're to take this story as a story, Let's think about the overwhelming number one aspect of parenting as it's presented in the Old Testament. Favoritism, right? How many families are torn apart in the Old Testament by favoritism, particularly the one family that carries the the, the plot for some 38 chapters in the first book of the Old Testament, Abraham. And Abraham's family, every generation in that family struggles with the fallout from favoritism. In fact, if you and I have done premarital counseling together, we've studied this together. If we let this story just be a story for a moment, let's see the importance for parents of expressing unique delight. Unique joy, unique celebration over the different children in different ways in our households. And there's a lesson for children here too. Uh, As we see this father, who when we take this passage in other ways, we'll call the, the righteous father and we'll recognize some overtones of the heavenly father. But if we take him as a dad in a story, there's a great reminder here for children as we see this dad trying to negotiate all of these roles and all of these different relationships, I now appreciate more than ever before one of my dad's many mantras in which he would say to me, now, Alan, you do understand that when we brought you home from Grant Hospital, they did not send with us an instruction manual, right? Parents are also just trying to sort this stuff out the best that we can, the best way we know how. And and this story, if we let it function just as a story without all the other theological overtones on it, wow, how it can be a blessing to parents and children just trying to sort all of that out. So first, it was a story. But of course it took on a life and it took on meaning. It, it, It functioned then as part of an event. As Jesus began to share this story with his listeners, it became an event. First, a historical event as Jesus met with those people wherever it was in ancient first century Palestine. And then as it became a literary event. As people wrote it down and shared it in the earliest church and it began to circulate throughout the ancient Mediterranean world. And so if we can envision this as an event... What I'd like us to do is try to imagine at which point in the story each listener would have started to hang his or her head. We read again a moment ago, all the folks who are gathered here in verses 1 and 2, there are those who are labeled as sinners and those who like to label others as sinners. 
And we might imagine Jesus sort of in the middle of this crowd with these two groups of people glaring at one another and the disciples standing awkwardly in the middle or perhaps scattered throughout. There's tension in the air. You could cut it with a knife. And Jesus begins to tell a story that has sort of universal application. I wonder at which point each one of those listeners from their respective camps would have started to listen nervously and shamefully and begin to hang their heads. Perhaps it was at the moment when Jesus started to talk early on in the story about a a young man who dishonored his family. One of the things that I have enjoyed in moving back to my hometown is the sharing of stories sometimes from my family from my family and my upbringing and sometimes from yours, of the times that our children did what children do. And there had to be these awkward conversations where there was a knock at a door and I'm sorry, apology, and so on and so forth. I wonder if there were those in the crowd that day who recognized that they had dishonored their family. Like the young boy who dishonored his daddy by saying, give me my third. My elder brother, according to scripture, is supposed to get a double portion, but just give me my third of the property and let me go off with it on my own. It's a wonder that dad even agreed to this. After all, that third of the estate was something that was supposed to not only promise them a present, but also promise them a future. This is what was to ensure that the younger brother would be cared for as his his children began to take on leadership of that household. Others may have started to sort of shuffle nervously and avoid eye contact when Jesus began to talk about a young man making poor use of his gifts, his God-given gifts, his family-entrusted gifts, and there were surely others who could relate. Or perhaps it was as Jesus went a little further and then a little further and then a little further as the story sort of descended with one mistake after another I wonder if there were people in the crowd who cringed at the familiarity of it all as they themselves had been the one who lived mistake after mistake until such point as was in the life of the the boy in the story that when the famine hit, he was completely overwhelmed. So many of us can relate to that moment when if everything had remained stable, we might have been able to turn the corner. But when the emergency happened, medical need, traffic accident, whatever it may have been, it caught us completely off guard, and that's when everything fell apart. I wonder if folks uh, stopped looking one another in the eye and started sort of shuffling back and forth when Jesus started talking about how embarrassed and desperate the young man was, and how his only possibility was to come home and beg from dad. Of course, there were others standing across the way opposite from those who had previously started hanging the head, and they may have responded at some other point in Jesus' story. There may have been some folks who recognized, you know what, that older brother was not the only one who's ever been jealous of his sibling. And there may have been some there who started hanging their head because they recognized they were not only jealous of their sibling, but they were jealous of their co-workers and their neighbors and even the family of faith. Somebody there might have decided to look down so as to pretend that it was dusk in his eye and not a tear making a track on his cheek when he was convicted on the realization that I have focused on myself rather than on being happy for someone else who is close to me. As Jesus went on talking about that older brother, there may be someone who remembered a family argument in which dad kept calling me son, but I kept saying, listen! Listen! just like the older brother. Or when the older brother added in this detail about the prostitutes, there may be someone who recognized, yeah, you know, I've I've embellished details to make myself look good and to make my sibling or someone else look bad. Some scholars point out that the father seems to think that the son is dead and worse, lost. And yet the elder brother somehow claims that he's kept up with him. Maybe there was even somebody in the crowd who said, I've done that. I've kept a connection with someone in order to use it later 
for leverage. And still others among us would shake with sobs at the familiarity of the painful truth that there is something worse than death. Because it is far worse to be lost than to be dead. This is why every trip that I have made to Washington, D.C. has included a trip to Arlington Cemetery. And there's a reason, there's a holy hush that comes over the changing of the guard at the Tomb of the Unknown. It's because name and identity and location of those soldiers and many other fallen just like them around the world remain ungrieved, unmourned in fullness. It's why every time the news tells us that there are remains being shipped back from Korea or from Vietnam, there are persons who go and wait hopefully at airports for someone who they've been missing for decades, for a lifetime. It's why if you drive along the rural lanes of our community and others like it, you'll see Little homesteads still flying the POW MIA flag out front. You'll never forget, they say. You'll never forget. Because this isn't just one who has died. It is one who is lost. Where is my child? Where is my brother? Where is my sister? That's not even adding in the additional labor of the layer of theological lostness. When a parent wonders over a child who is dead or alive, either one. Does my child have any sense of meaning, of purpose, of awareness of the holy, of the transcendence of the living and loving God? I imagine by the time Jesus finished the introduction to these two stories respectively, pretty much that whole crowd was avoiding eye contact and, head, eye contact and hanging their heads in shame, perhaps weeping openly. But of course, Jesus doesn't end those stories with an introduction. He continues developing those characters and moving further and further into that story. And so I also wonder, not only at what point did they begin to look down and look away from one another, at what point did they begin to look up? At what point did the tears shift from tears of grief to tears of hopefulness? Perhaps it was when Someone recognized, now wait a minute, the father didn't wait. Wait a minute. The father didn't wait for the son to come home and get all the way through this story that he rehearsed. He didn't wait for the son to beg for mercy. He cut in and ran to him. Not only did he not wait, not only did he run to him, the father kissed him. Kissed him. Kissed him like Jacob kissed Esau, kissed him like Hosea kissed Gomer, kissed him like the heavenly one would describe it every time Israel would come home to the covenant. That language of, of love, of intimacy, beloved. Wait a minute. He called him son. He didn't say... Go find my son and work for him. He called him son. And then he went out to the elder brother too. Just like he ran down the lane to the gate to welcome the younger brother. When the older brother had all these hang-ups and all these issues, he went out into the field to talk to him too. And one by one throughout the crowd, those who were listening from their respective backgrounds began to lift their heads and began perhaps to dry their eyes or to weep fresh tears and began to square their shoulders and began to realize there's more to the story of the righteous father. He called him son. Even when the son wouldn't call him father, he still called him son. And... There's a party waiting. There's a party waiting with plenty 
to eat and plenty to sing and plenty about which to dance and enough noise to attract the neighbors and the hired hands and the friends. And there's a party going for one son and for the other if he'll come. This story is at one level a story. This story is at another level an event, both historically and literarily, but it is perhaps at the deepest level a glimpse into God's own heart as described from the lips of the Son of God. Three parables, lost, short, lost sheep, lost coin, lost sons, and the first two begin with a similar pattern. Which one of you? Who among you? Jesus asks. Because he's going to tell stories. One, two, three stories of something so familiar that everyone gathered can relate. Which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Similarly, in the second story, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, doesn't light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? But the third parable doesn't start that way. Jesus has introduced us to the pattern, but the third story, Jesus jumps right into the story to the character development. The story itself builds the question. Until finally after elder brother and younger brother have been fully introduced, the story itself implies the question, which one of you cannot celebrate over a dead brother saved, over a lost brother found? Come on, really now, Jesus seems to ask. We're not just talking about sheep and coins anymore. Which one of you cannot be pleased when you gain another brother? Which one of you cannot be pleased when your own flesh and blood comes home? Who would resent this? It's as if Jesus says, I know you're offended by grace. We've talked about this with regards to vineyards and proper payout at the end of a work day, pay the same wage for one who works all day in the hot sun and the same one who comes at the, the 11th hour. We've been over this before. I know you're offended by grace. But in the words of Fred Craddock, let the little brother return, but let it be in sackcloth. Let him know his place, Dad. I'm offended by the grace. And the groups of people in verses 1 and 2 glare at each other. And I also know elder brother. Priests, Pharisees, I know you also justifiably do not wish to condone sinful behavior. There's something here for everybody in this crowd to struggle with. I know you're trying to live your lives for righteousness. You've been taught this. We've studied it together in synagogue. You've dedicated, and I know you genuinely at some level do not understand the grace being extended to the one who seems to have lived his life in sin. However, here is the greater grace of the creator and sustainer God. This is the mystery of that wondrous love. Blessing another doesn't curse you. Blessing another does not displace you. Blessing another does not mock or undermine the life which you have tried to live. It's just the limitless nature of my love that overflows and pours out regardless of where you are or where you're coming from when you walk down the lane to 
come home. Blessing another means sharing that which you've already benefited from. See, the father loves the older brother too. And the father goes out to the older brother too. But this is what the elder brother misses, or at least this is the question mark hanging in the air at the end of these three stories. The party is for him too. Will he accept it? The party is for him too. Will he come home? The party is for him too. Will he come inside? And dine and feast and dance and sing. It's for him too. If he'll accept it. Our invitation this morning goes all the way back to verse 17, to that wondrous moment when the younger brother is at the depths of despair, when he's squandered everything and then the emergency strikes and this, this boy who's been raised in a Jewish home has to take up with the pigs and would love to be able to eat the fruit that is in there with the slop, but nobody will offer him anything. He's literally working himself to starvation. Verse 17 says, he came to himself. Even in the depths of filth, he came to himself. We could spend six months on that verse alone. What does it mean to come to himself? Well, for one thing, He remembers who he is. He remembers his daddy. He remembers his people. He remembers his home. He remembers his faith. He remembers who he's been brought up to be. And for the first time in his life, he embraces it. Today, if you're ready to come to yourself and to embrace who you are in Christ, to embrace who you were created to be, and to come home to the family of God, oh, there is a celebration that awaits. There's a celebration in the life of this church, but there's a celebration that awaits in the greater family of God and in heaven as well that goes beyond anything we can simulate here on earth. You are God's precious child. You are God's very beloved. And the moment you come to yourself, the moment you come to yourself and choose to take the step toward home, you'll see the Father running out to meet to welcome you, precious, beloved child, welcome home. If that's your decision today, then as we sing this next song, would you come and share what's on your heart today? Or if you're recognizing that coming into this faith family and knowing this as home is what's next for you on your journey, or if there's some other sense in which you are coming to yourself and remembering who you are and needing to set right your broken journey with Christ. Then would you come and share as we sing and celebrate however it is that you need to respond to the work of the Holy One moving in your life today. We stand and we sing in hopes that you'll come.